Plus, I think people are wrong about you guys. I think people think call you a great, the greatest rock and roll band, and you know whatever. And I know that was just a thing someone oh, said on stage. Yeah. But you've never just been a rock and roll band. No, not at all. No. It's not it, 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 the Rolling Stones. One of the most interesting things about being in the Rolling Stones is we talked earlier before we started recording about um, the Chieftains. Yeah, and Irish playing folk Irish music. music. Yeah. You know, the Rolling Stones can play that music if we want. We can play it. <laughs> Mick Jagger. Tom. How are you? Good. <laughs> Thanks for being here, man. This is cool. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here. I love the new record. Thank you. How are you feeling? How are you feeling putting this thing out? Well, good. I mean, it, it's quite a long time since we finished it now because uh, we finished, I finished mixing in um, beginning of March. So, you know, I was very up <laughs> there. I was really up and then I've had to sort of put it on the back burner because it takes so long to make the vinyl. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, I'm very excited about it. So I'm back into being, listening to it again and stuff. And uh, yeah, um, uh, it was fun to make and um, made pretty quickly. Yeah? Yeah, just like like about three, four weeks, most of it. Um, the three, four weeks, then two weeks of overdubs. And then I did vocals, I went somewhere else to do the vocals. And then I mixed it remotely with Andy in the mixer, yeah. Sorbonne. That was fun. We were three locations. I was in the Caribbean. Andy was in LA. Sorbonne was in, uh, Sorbonne was in um, North Carolina. Jeez. So yeah, we, that's, we, uh, that's how you do it. But we, I've done that before. But if you have fast internet, you can do that. So you're all live, you're mixing live. She's very different than how we used to be making records, you know? Like I heard someone talk about Django Reinhardt's record one time and they yeah. said back then making a record was like going to the moon or something like that. You know? And now you can do it over the, the internet for God's sake. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, in a way, we made the record just like Django Reinhardt made his record in a way where, where this record was made all in the room with the musicians in the room. Uh, you know, so we're all in the room, Ronnie, me, um, Keith and Steve, Matt Clifford, we're all in the room, not for every track because not everyone's on every track, but. And then every track, we're, we're in the room just blasting it out. And, you know, and afterwards you you go through the takes and say, oh, this is a good take, this is a good, oh, I'll leave that one. And then, then you work on your overdubs. And that's pretty much, you know, how you make a rock record, you know. I was going to say, I mean, there's not a lot of records made like that anymore. Was that I, well, I think that most indie bands make records like that. That's, yeah. how, that's how you make, but I mean, what's, what's easier is, um, is that, um, after you've chosen the takes and doing the overdubs and everything, and the editing and stuff is just so much easier now than it used to be. Yeah, there's no tape. There's no tape. Well, it hasn't been taped for ages, yeah. not for 25 years. Yeah. Haven't used tape. We used tape actually on this album. We used tape for Rolling Stone Blues. Oh, we recorded that on tape. For fun? Or just, <laughs> just for fun, kind of a girl vibe, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's just Keith and me, so we record it on 24-track um, tape. Oh, it's sort of like harken back to the old days kind bit. of thing. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Any, uh, at this stage, I mean, this far into it, any nerves putting out a record? Well, you always, um, I mean, I think you say, you know that it's, that you like it, you know, that's the first stage and you, you like it. Um, and and you play it to people, you play it to friends, and you play it to colleagues and so on, and you get a vibe of that they that, that they seem to be liking it. But you never know when when people when you come out with something, you never know the mood of can be not down on you maybe for some reason. Yeah. But, but I mean, I think it's been pretty positive reaction so far. We only heard people have only heard angry. So, yeah. But um, it seems to be pretty positive so far. Angry is a great song. Thank you. How did that one come together now? Um, I just, I just uh, was, I was in the Caribbean. I was just um, on my own and I just started playing it. Just that riff and that, that uh, I just, I thought it had in my head before I was playing it on the guitar. And then, uh, and then I was playing it to a uh, drum machine, you know? Yeah. And then, so it's just a real simple beat. You boom, bah, you know, it's just almost the same beat as, as what we've got. Although I mean, Steve plays it obviously more interesting yeah, than the machine than does. The machine. Yeah, 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 right. But, right. but it was, it's the same idea. Yeah. And uh, and then you know, brought it to the you know Keith. Uh, we're, we're, 
and I went to Jamaica with Steve and Matt, and and we ran through and he said, "Oh, I love it," and he, and he put his own thing on it, you know. Yeah. And uh, um, it's pre- I mean, it's pretty. That was one really easy to come together, you know. And those ones sometimes feel really good that you know when they come together that quickly yeah. and everyone falls in on their parts, yeah. you know. And then I had to work on the vocals and how to make it more exciting as it goes on, you know, to change the vocal lines and stuff. But yeah, it's a good one. I love I loved seeing you. I, I love that it's a Jagger Richards. I love seeing you two on stage together because I've been doing research on for this interview like, for I'll say a month. Okay. Like, <laughs> yeah, like reading books and reading articles and yeah. reading interviews all the way back to like 62 up till now. And it's funny to see the Keith thing come up over and over again. You get asked it in like 65. Yeah, you yeah, get yeah, asked yeah. it in like 71. Yeah, yeah. You get asked it in like 83. Yeah, yeah. You give a different answer every single yeah, time. And seeing you and him on stage yesterday at the press conference, just your arms around each other was so so beautiful to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like where where are you now writing songs together and, and all that? Uh, well, you know, we we did some songwriting, you know, like, I mean, I I like, I, I mean, it's so different now. I mean, because we used to be, we, we used to live in the same apartment you know, when yeah. we started off um, writing songs together. And so we'd be, I, I wouldn't even play guitar half the time. I'd just be writing the top lines for Keith's chord sequences. And, you know, and he would sometimes suggest melodies and I would come up with all the words. And But, you know, this that's a long time ago and things evolve and change and, you know, um, you know, I like to I like to write songs on my own. You know, I don't live in the same continent as Keith. You know, uh, um, so uh, he doesn't do Zoom, so I can't write on Zoom with him. You know, yeah. So, but still, when we got together in Jamaica and started jamming these things around, that was like you know, it's the same as we always have been. You know, so it falls back into that thing where you know you get a bit. You know, what about this bit? You know, how can I get? You know. Keith, what do you think about this chorus? Should it go here? Should it go there? Or, you know, or he like in Whole Wide World, for instance, um, he kind of sh- he shortened the verse that I'd written. So instead of playing like four bars on every chord, he he made it into two bars on every chord, which made it more kind of funky. Yeah. You know? So yeah. So it, it, it's um yeah. So it's a it's a kind of interesting partnership. But you know, I I. I like, you know, um, Andy also helped me a lot with, you know, writing, you know, helps me by, you know, telling me, oh, you know, this, you could do that better, you know, that. Still, that, he'll still it, do that to you. Or, or Andy, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, Andy. You know, yeah. it, so I, I, I listen to what outside people tell me, you know, I, I'm not like so kind of like entrenched that if, if, if Andy said to me, oh, those words, a great mate, but you could do a lot better, I'd just go back and rewrite them. I'd be terrified to say it to you, to be honest. He's not terrified to say it to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to be tasked with it, to be honest. No, but the, go in it, and tell Mick that no, it's but, like, yeah, no, you but know? That's what's fun about working with people without, I don't mind if, you know, if, if Keith says to me that that could be better, I'll make it better. If Andy Watts says it can be better, I'll try. Right. If, if I disagree with them, I'll tell them I disagree with them. Right. Okay, yeah. I'll do it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love the McCartney was on this record yeah. too. He plays he plays bass on uh, a track on the record. Yeah, yeah, he does. How did that happen? Um, well, uh, Paul was in LA when we were recording, and he was supposed to work with Andy one week, and uh, Andy had said, "Look, I'm working on this record." For- if it takes six months, I'm, I'm going to do nothing else. And then he says, and suddenly we get to this one week, he so said, I forgot to tell you I was supposed to work with Paul this week. So we said, we worked out the schedule. And so, so said, when we get Paul to come in and play on something. So um, so I said, on what? You know, what is what? I've never played bass with Paul. Yeah. I've sung with him, but I haven't played bass. With him. So I don't know what he's going to play. And we, we suggested he played on this sort of punk tune, you know. Yeah. So and I didn't know how it was going to work out, but it he really rocked it and he loved doing it. You know, he said, oh, it's great playing with a band." You know, he says, it's "Really enjoyable playing with a band." So was we, he in the room with you? Was it? Yeah, all, it was yeah. all in the room. We're all in the room playing together. So there's you and Keith. And yeah, I'm playing. I'm playing guitar. Keith's playing guitar. And Paul McCartney's playing bass. Paul's playing bass. Ronnie's playing guitar. Do you understand play. that that feels meaningful to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I understand it's a session and yeah. you're musicians playing together. Yeah. You understand that historically yeah. that feels meaningful yeah. that you yeah, guys yeah. played together, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, it's and it's fun, but it seemed so natural, you know? It didn't seem 
and Paul was so natural and, and relaxed and, and he enjoyed it and we, we knocked it out really quick. Did you guys have a good relationship going through this whole thing? Uh, who, who? You and Paul. Going through what thing? Well, your, your lives, your careers. Our whole life? But Jesus, Mick, you know what I mean, right? Like, I think if you look at like, because again, I'm doing crazy amounts of research here. And again, if you want to talk about how much Keith comes up, the Beatles come up a lot, yeah. right? You know? Yeah. And I find that a lot of what got written about in say the like, 70s and 80s, uh, I guess up until the early 80s, was you and John. Yeah, well, John was a great friend, close friend of mine. Yeah. And, you know, he was very acerbic and funny and witty and intelligent and everything. And, but I also knew Paul, who's a different kind of personality. And, and um, you know, I've always been friends with him. And um, we don't see each other that much. But we do sort of text each other and, you know. And um, so we sort of keep in touch. So, I mean, I've always got on well with him. And, uh, and, and Ronnie and Paul also see each other quite a lot. So we we have this sort of communication. Um, nice to hear Stevie Wonder on the record. Yeah, on he's on Sweet Sound of Heaven. And he opened up for you guys. Yes, we talked about that when he came to the studio. <laughs> he came to the studio and we started talking about. He said, "I haven't really played with you guys since we played on tour, and we played um, we played a, a medley of Satisfaction and Uptight." <laughs> da, ka, oh, it's the same beat. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I can hear it. It's man. the same beat. Yeah, yeah, I can hear it's it. It's the same beat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same beat. It's that beat. Da, 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 da. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So we talked about that, and it was very funny. What do you remember about those tours for him opening up for you? Well, a lot. I mean, it was a great tour. We had, I think, we had Stevie, we had I and Tina Turner, we had BB King. That was an amazing lineup. Yeah. <laughs> on a tour. Yeah. On an arena tour. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was. It was amazing. Um, I've sort of been trying to figure out how to talk to you about this part. Is And only, not because it's uh, controversial, but only because it's a bit emotional, to be honest, with, with Charlie uh, on the record. I was so yeah. happy when I looked at the track listing yeah. and I saw that, that Charlie plays on this record. Yeah. So these are older Charlie... Uh, 2019. It's not that long ago. No. Um, so we'd record... We, you know, we've, over the last five years, we've done quite a lot of recording with Don was, but we it had been a bit sporadic, and we hadn't really finished any. There's a lot of unfinished material, you know, and, and um, songs that hadn't been done. And anyway. so, when we were put, putting this together, we said, "Well, which ones do we like? You know, which ones do we think that will fit on this record that Charlie's on?" And we finished those, and so we put these two these two tracks we picked for Char with Charlie on. I mean, I, I love both. There, I, I mean, I. Love both the tracks. I didn't just pick them because Charlie's on them. Kind yeah. of, you know what I mean? Yeah. I would have. Yeah. But they're, they're both, um, you know, contenders for this record. You know. Yeah. What was he like? Charlie. Yeah. Wow, that's really a hard question. I mean, I'm I knew, I knew him since I was nineteen. You know, and I hang out a lot with Charlie. He was like one of my sort of close friends, and we had a, Charlie and I had a lot of interests outside of. Just playing a band, you know, and well, we we used to we loved sport, you know, football and cricket. Charlie and I used to go to cricket together a lot. Um, we would talk about football. He's a big Tottenham fan, I'm an Arsenal fan. It's like a big competition. Um, Charlie's very knowledgeable about that. He used to play football when he was a kid, pretty good, much better than me. And um, and uh, and Charlie and I liked all kinds of different music, you know. So. Charlie, you know, everyone says, oh, Charlie, Charlie always loved jazz. Well, he did love jazz, you know, he, he really loved jazz and he introduced me all kinds of them. I used to love jazz too. When I was a teenager, I, I was a real jazz fan. And, and so I knew quite a lot about jazz, not like him, but, you know, that jazz was the hip thing to like. You yeah, know? kind of pre-bop, right? But yeah, when yeah, it was, yeah, when it yeah. was sort of well, more accessible. Kind well, of... yeah, and, but I liked, you know, I liked post-war jazz, you know, yeah. I used to like... Jerry Mulligan sound and you know I used to listen to all that kind of stuff Sonny Rollins you yeah, know, cool. who played on one of our records yeah he sure did I was you know so I like that kind of music um you know a lot of it I didn't like you know but you know I liked the Cannibal Adderley I loved Charlie and I used to go and see Cannibal Adderley oh, cool. um I remember Charlie and I once going to see him at the Apollo, and we would like, we, we would really go and you know Charlie and I would go and we'd go, oh can't believe we'd go and see him in a club or in a theatre, you know, and um, 
So Charlie and I had a lot of those kind of interests, and we also liked. Um, Charlie loved, you know, beautiful objects. You know, he liked antiques. He liked furniture. So we talked a lot about things like that. You know, so we had a lot of interests in common apart from just being a band. You know, but I mean, Charlie like all kinds of music. He he liked African music like me. He liked reggae music before everyone had even heard it. Yeah, know? before before Bob Marley, Ch Charlie and I were listening to reggae music before it was like mainstream. Yeah. You know? um, so yeah, so we 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 would be have a lot in common with that stuff. The reason I'm interested in it, I suppose, is because to to the world, Charlie Charlie of the Rolling Stones died, and how does the Rolling Stones go on and all that yeah. kind of stuff? But I thought, my Jesus, like, a you lost your buddy, yeah, and you lost a buddy who's around your age, yeah, exactly. How was that for you? Well, it's, it's very difficult to lose friends, you know. Um, as you get older, you lose a lot of friends. And not only friends, you, you, it's very weird because you not, okay, they're not friends of yours necessarily, but they're people that have been in your life, whether they're musicians or, you know, that you've admired or actors or wherever, you know, whatever they are, but lots of people of your age group yeah. or, or generation, you might say, have all gone. And then, but, um, um, which is why I think I've got a lot of friends that aren't in my age group. <laughs> <laughs> they stick around a bit longer. <laughs> they were, yeah. they were younger people, you know. I mean, I don't want to just hang out with younger people, but I mean, yeah. a lot of the people in my generation are no longer here to hang out yeah, with. So what am I going to do? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So um, yes, yeah, so it's a lot, it's a big loss when you meet someone you know for like sixty years, you know, and work with. It's a huge loss. I'm not Dr. Phil. But is it scary to lose someone so close to you? Are you someone your age who's close to you, and you've been up through the whole thing with? Yeah, it, I don't know if it's scary. It's very sad. Um, um, of course, it, you know you think about your own mortality, but you think about people think about that from much earlier ages than mine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I you know, know people usually think about mortality when you lose your first pet. Yeah. <laughs> That's when it hits you. Um, then you might lose your you know, grandparents or something. But, uh, so, yeah, so, um, but these things, I mean, you know, it's part of life, you know, and, and um, you know, we we had a lot of sadness and Brian Jones died, you know, yeah. a lot of young people died in their 20s, you know, yeah. and um, famous musicians that we admired, you know, Jimi Hendrix, people I love really dearly, yeah. you know, um, died early and and it's very sad but there it's part of life can't make this all about death that's the name of the show you don't know them did no one told you <laughs> dr this death called, will this now is called, speak this is called tom power on death <laughs> <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't know that that's why i'm irish right that's why, that's why we talk about these things it's, it's the depressive part that's the i mean that's all i got buddy that's all, look, look at me this, this, this beard doesn't come from joyful feelings <laughs> um it's an amazing feat man to see this band go on for 60 years. I mean, yeah. and I'd like well, to, to think about everything you just told me, to be honest. We're not going to talk about death, <laughs> but think about losing Brian. Yeah. Think about uh, losing Charlie, but also thinking about the changing of the music industry. You, yeah. know, you and I were talking about the early days, and then you want to talk about uh, vinyls to eight tracks to tapes yeah. to CDs to streaming to yeah. TikTok to concert tours, meaning so much to concert tours, who knows yeah. what they even mean anymore. Yeah. You're not going to have an answer to this question, but I'm never going to. I'm never going to uh, get a chance to ask it to you. So I'm going to ask it to you anyway. How do you lead a band through all that? By staying abreast of what's going on. What do you mean? Well, you you have to kind of vaguely. I'm not saying I'm slavishly um, um, trying to you know be at the cutting edge of everything, but you have to understand how things work. You know, in in the current world, and that doesn't just apply to the music industry, it applies to lots of things. I mean, you know, driving a driving a car is a different experience driving a car in 1960. Yeah. So, and and the record business, like all businesses, uh, it changes a lot. I mean, the, you know, the, re the record business being a business of technology, it, it never stays never stays the same it never stayed the same ever you know so we when we first started in the record business it was it was about only singles 
it was about 45. Pre-album. Yeah. yeah. The, what, albums by um, pop acts did not sell. What sold was um, show albums like South Pacific. And in this, I don't know if this is meaningless to a lot of you. Oh, no, no. I but, know, yeah, but, I'm, you, I'm, but you know what I mean? I'm 103. So show, don't so know show that, albums, yeah. those ones, Frank Sinatra might sell albums. The this kind of, this yeah, kind of thing. thing yeah. um, that was the, what sold albums, and then suddenly the Beatles came along, and they started selling album pop albums. So it was a huge change from it was just about top forty. It was about selling singles. That's all there was, and of course, no money in that, uh, you know, really. And then record companies, rather belatedly, they wow, they because there are millions of vinyl, you know, of pop artists, and suddenly that was a huge change. Then the CD revolution came along. Everyone threw away their vinyl, and everyone bought CDs of what the vinyl they have. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, and they had eight tracks and we had cassettes and, blah, blah, blah. and it changed all the time and then back to vinyl. And then, uh, and and streaming, you know, is like much maligned, but I mean, as far as you can, the, the interesting thing about it is that people of all generations can access music from all periods. Whereas before, if I wanted to buy you know, an old blues record from 1955, that was really difficult. I had to do a mail order, I had to go into a specialist shop, even though I had plenty of money. I used to go and buy it, now I can just, there it is, it's right there. So what does that mean? Well, that means that, you know, kids of 16 can access anything they want. It might also mean that it's a little less special. I think about you guys, that when you had to order those chess records. Oh yeah. You had to, your identity was those things because they were so hard to get. Yeah, man. so hard to get, which makes them more desirable in a way because they're, they're, they're so hard to get and I've got one and you don't. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like a collection, you know, of, of rare goods. Isn't that the story of you and Keith? Isn't the story of you and Keith that you had those records? Yeah, we, I Nigeria? had the rare records and yeah. he didn't have the rare records. And where'd you get them? How yeah. do you get those rare records? <laughs> you know, I, I he probably had some rare records, but, you know, it was... There was like one or two shops in, in London you could buy them and they were hugely expensive because they were imported and the guy, you know what I mean? It wasn't yeah. like and you know, money, it was, it was expensive. And um, you couldn't buy just as many as you want. And um, to discover, and if you're a musician, you've got to listen to this stuff and get it and part of your uh, playing ability, listening to these, trying to copy these licks and how is he going to sing that? What's that song, you know? Uh, Robert Johnson, these things like well, they're not like available, you know, but but for all its people complain about streaming and everything, I think it's amazing that 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 you know that I can find things that are really rare yeah. or interesting that I've never heard. But what I find interesting about you is that I know a lot of people. Uh, and I'm not going to say names, but I've talked to people who are of your generation in music and some who are still making music, yeah. and a lot of them are sort of mired in nostalgia. And yeah. they'll say to me things like, Tom, it was never as good as it was back in there. Or like, I'm not even going to put my stuff on, I'm not even going to put my stuff on <laughs> Spotify. Or, you know, they get they get uh, sort of uh, fortified in yeah. an era, but you never seem to do that. Well, no, but you don't want to do that. That's ridiculous. Because you're available on everything, you know. You want to buy a, a vinyl Rolling Stones record, you can buy one if you want to but buy But not just format, kind of everything. Like yeah, the Rolling Stones are never you never allow them to be fortified in like a retro thing yeah no, that's no, no. important i don't want it to be in a retro thing and uh, this album the 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 hackney diamonds album i mean when i talked to andy i mean andy's like a pop producer that's where he's made his name you know and i was going like, andy you know i made all this pop record but i mean he loves rock and roll knows all the history backwards you know can play all the licks can play all the rolling stones licks himself yeah. you know it's just pretty impressive and i and and but i said andy i I want it to, I mean, it's, I want it to be true to the school, you know, but I want it to be like a Rolling Stones record, but but, it, but it's got a sound like it was recorded this year, you know, the, the sonic levels of, and the the way it sounds has got to sound like now. We don't want it to sound like 40 years ago. And of course it doesn't. It sounds like now, the clarity of it, you know, and the fidelity of it. And if you listen to it, Compare it to an old Rolling Stones record, it's very, very different. Very, very, very different. Yeah, yeah. but still has that heart of the it's music. Still, but it still has all the things of the Rolling Stones. Yeah. But. Plus, I think people are wrong about you guys. I think people think call you a great, the greatest rock and roll band, and you know, whatever. And I know that was just a thing someone oh, said on stage. Yeah. But you've never just been a rock and roll band. No, not at all. No. It's not it, it, the Rolling Stones. 
one of the most interesting things about being in the Rolling Stones is we talked earlier before we started recording about um, the Chieftains yeah, and Irish playing music. Irish mu music. Yeah. You know, the Rolling Stones can play that music if we want, we can play it. And and uh, we do, you know. And uh, I mean, on this, the, uh, you know, we we play different styles, you know, we, we, and we go, of course there's fashions and styles. And Keith and I went through a whole period where we were listening to the incredible string band and we got very influenced by that, this yeah. kind of music, yeah. you know, and, and they were, they were kind of like a niche kind of folk band, but they're very interesting. Yeah. So, um, and so we, Keith and I were very in, into folk music, border ballads, you know, um, you know, I would go to Arna and I'd sing, you know, I would sing, you know, Handsome Molly, you mm -hmm. know, at, at, after dinner, you're asked to sing something just on your own. Yeah. I would sing Handsome Molly or I yeah. would sing, you know, um, Matty Groves or oh, something yeah. like that, you know. And and Keith and I were, were, were really into it. And, and that's all part of our, you know, folk music, country music, American country music, blues, all this stuff. And me, for me, you know, I like dance music. You know, I, I like dancing. So I, you know, I like dance music. So, you know, I, I've, I've got, haven't got a, a lot of, uh, I mean, I can only listen to techno for like an hour, but that's my max here yeah. in a club. But I, but I mean, I like all kinds of music. And I'm, you know, I, I listen to lots, lots of African music, mm. old and new, you know. So I, I, as far as I'm concerned, and the Rolling Stones, we can play anything. Yeah, and you can hear that on this record. And I, I loved it, and we have to, I, I'm getting the boot. But I tell you, man, I love the record. Thank you. Uh, I hope it's not the last one. No, it's not. We were two-thirds uh, through the next one. So shall I see you again in a couple of years? Yeah. Yeah, right. Hopefully. Yeah. Thanks very much, Tom. <laughs> Listen, I, uh, you'll last. I might not. That's oh, the yeah, thing. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks, Mick. I appreciate it. Thank you.